I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. I'm happy today to introduce to you Josh Nielsen. I appreciate you coming and sharing your story. And uh, nice to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah. You've got an interesting story from the sense of you were born in the church, but your folks were not terribly active. Oh, they weren't active at all. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, no, I was, I was born culturally Mormon. I was born into a neighborhood with, I would say, 90% of the houses on our street. Where was this at? This was in Kearns. Oh, okay. And in the 70s, Kearns was kind of the harriman of then. It yeah. was an expansion neighborhood. It was out in the sticks. And so <laughs> my dad was the general contractor, built the neighborhood, and we were literally surrounded oh by young LDS families moving out there for affordable housing. Yeah. So uh, a great community, I guess, you thought to raise, to be raised. And Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in any given weekend, we had 20 kids running the streets. Yeah. I mean, it was fun. The, the, the whole T intersection of our street was just kids. Yeah. And I was probably the only non-LDS kid on that block. Wow. And did, did you ever get a sense that you weren't part of the group? Yeah, I did. Uh, when I say I was culturally raised LDS, it, it was, I was, I was growing up in the early 80s, and the church hadn't quite transitioned into its feel-good church that it is today stretching out reaching to yeah the, being nice yeah. And, and so because my parents drank and smoked because they left the church um, when I was growing up there was families in the in the neighborhood that wouldn't let me play with their kids and I was actually not oh, invited dear. to birthday parties really yeah uh, uh, clearly it scarred me for life but because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you but you weren't they didn't want you to influence their children yeah yeah that, and, right? and you know I remember having conversations with some of the kids in our neighborhood you know even in kindergarten they're saying well your parents smoke so you're gonna grow up smoking and really you know things of that nature but there were some very good families in the neighborhood as well that you know took me to church on a regular basis as well as family members so I was exposed so did your folks want you to go to church or you wanted to go? My folks supported just this church. They, they supported me going. Okay. They wanted nothing to do with it, but uh, they weren't against it. Okay. And any time a family member offered to take me or friends, they let me go and didn't have any negative words hmm. against it. Now you did eventually get baptized. I did at 10 years old. Yeah. Uh, I think I think I slipped through the cracks. I must have missed church that day on my birthday <laughs> uh, when I turned eight. eight. Yeah. Old, yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of our neighbors and I, I, my grandparents probably had something to do with it. Yeah. yeah they they uh, arranged for me to be baptized at 10. Okay. And so active is in primary and Sunday school and. I sporadically attended young, Sunday school. Young young men's eventually. And... Did almost no young men's. I think after about 12, uh, other than playing church volleyball. Hmm. Uh, my best friend across the street, his dad ultimately ended up being stake president. And oh. so, you know, whenever they were at the church, I was there. But uh, after Boy Scouts, I, I largely just fell away from the church. So no seminary, probably? No seminary at all. I, okay. I found seminary to be a, a waste of time because I wanted to graduate as fast as possible. Okay. And I wasn't going to give up credits okay. for seminary. All right. Well, I know you eventually get more serious about the church. What happens? So I was about 20 years old. And I had, uh, I, you know, in high school, I have an amazing network of friends that I'm still in contact with today. Really? So, you know, we largely just partied it up from graduation 
until I was about 20 years old. And then my best friend, he... Uh, now, was these in, were non-Mormons friends? Yes, generally, uh, most of them, yeah. Non-Mormon, okay. Yeah, yeah, most of them were. Um, but they were culturally LDS. They were raised in neighborhoods just like I was. Oh, really? But their parents were not LDS. And so oh, okay. my best friend, who was an atheist, um, met a Mormon girl and was quickly converted. Oh. And he wrote me a letter when we were about 20 and invited me to his baptism. Okay. He said he had found God. And so about this time, my grandfather had passed away, and he was a remarkable man. He was um, a very devout LDS, but he loved Jesus. Really? Uh, my Redeemer Lives was his favorite song. Mm -hmm. You know, he was just, if there was ever a Christian man, it was him. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that, you know, he belonged to the LDS church. And so I was really moved by the testimonies at his death, and then I was really moved by this baptism experience of my best friend. So we would argue about whether God existed or not. And so first thing I said to him was, so I was right, God existed. Oh. I had to get that little dig in. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but, you know, after that, I, w I decided I was going to join the church and give it a try. I had a spiritual experience at his baptism that I don't think I could validate today, but I just had this overwhelming feeling you need to get back to church. Really? Yeah, so I chose to... Uh, go back and explore it, and I told my girlfriend, then wife at the time, like, I'm going to try this Mormon thing, really? and okay. dove literally headfirst into it. Now, you had been baptized. Did you need, did you be baptized again? You no. To, okay. No, so I was thinking about this. Ironically, of all the wards in the valley I could have chosen, I chose to go to my family's ward, the neighborhood I grew up in. Oh, okay. So when I went back, I told my wife, I said, a lot of these people are pretty judgmental. Be prepared for them to not welcome us. Yeah. And the exact opposite happened. I walked through the door and it was an overwhelming sense of community. People that I hadn't seen in years were hugging oh. me and they rallied around us. It was actually really a remarkable community experience. So you felt like, boy, the Lord's behind all this and I've mm -hmm. made good decisions and Absolutely. I've been prompted properly and yep. moving forward. Okay. Yeah, so I sat down with the bishop who had known me since I was a kid, Young kid. and told him everything I did. Oh, and I, your confession thing. Huh? I told him yeah. everything. I can yeah. still see the look on his face. I feel bad for the guy because there <laughs> were some felonies in there. But uh, <laughs> oh dear. But no, he you know he he prescribed me a year's repentance. Okay. Did not require me to be re rebaptized, um, and the church rallied around me for that year, and it actually ended up being probably eight or nine months before they deemed me repented, okay. and I received the ironic priesthood, okay. and could take the sacrament. Wow. For the first time as a as a member. Now your wife is she at this point? She, you're married, at this point. At this point we're engaged. Oh, okay. Yeah. And is she a member? No. No. Okay. Never was. Never joined. Okay. Spent the entire almost five years that I was fully active, not joining the church. Okay. Yeah. It was actually she she she's a smart lady. Okay. One of the dumbest things she ever did was marrying me. I say, but yeah, she. <laughs> Sure, she did. wouldn't say that. No, but, no. So you uh, commit yourself to the church uh, wholeheartedly. It sounds like and I got did. into it. And yeah, I went. So within a year, I had had the Aaronic priesthood. I'd had the Melchizedek priesthood, and I, I had earned my temple recommend. Oh, okay. And I was for the first time a full card carrying member in the church that I had grown up in, and it was a pretty. It was. I felt pretty fantastic about myself at that point. Yeah. Well, let's kind of look at this then from your, those Mormon eyes, that you, if you can remember back. What did you think of Jesus at this moment, at, at this point? <laughs> Jesus was a spirit brother. Okay. Uh, I didn't see him anywhere near the way I do today. Uh, matter of fact, Jesus played very little in my Mormon experience. In your conversion or your, mm -hmm. your efforts during that year to be more committed and be yeah. more righteous? Everything was about... It wasn't about Jesus. Not at all. Okay. No, everything was about the rules. I was going to follow the rules. Obey the rules. I was going to be seen as super Mormon. Did you sense that, that, okay, I'm now living the law? Yes. I'm, I'm living, you did. I did, absolutely. Oh. I'll, I'll tell you, from my perspective, I was doing it all. I was attending all the meetings. I wasn't breaking the Sabbath. I was, I was uh, not smoking, drinking, you know, no premarital sex. Everything was, Tithing, oh. I tied to the gross amount. Yeah. Sat down with the bishop and gave him my, my bank statement, and we went through it. I mean, I was, I did it. Yeah. And you had a testimony of Joseph Smith, and you'd read the Book of Mormon, I know. I wouldn't even say, I mean, I read the Book of Mormon, and I was so young uh, in the context of the Book of Mormon. I would say I didn't read it. I plugged through it. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a tough read. Yeah. I take Mark Twain's quote pretty seriously on that. But uh, 
I read through it, and I think just the sheer inertia when I read when I made the promise prayer at the end of it that I had read the book, I got the warm and fuzzy feeling, and yeah. I more I didn't even really have a testimony of Joseph Smith so much as I did of the church. Oh, that's just okay. the church was what was rallying me. Okay. Yeah. What did the Bible mean to you at this point? I you know there was a point in my in my LDS journey that I tried to study the Bible, and really? I did. Oh, I I don't during mean, that year. Not during that year. It was it was after. Earlier. Yeah, oh. no, it was after. Oh, okay. I was I was going to be a Bible scholar. I was going to be the most knowledgeable scriptural person in the church, and I could not get past the genealogies in Genesis. <laughs> no matter how hard I tried, there was a wall there, and it it's so just never spoke to you at all. Then, never huh? did. It was it was closed to me at that point. We carried it to church every Sunday, I'm sure. But I did. I then, had but... I had my little uh, case with my brown Book of Mormon and and. Uh, King James Version of the Bible sure. that was given to me in my baptism when okay. I was 10. I guess just another question along those lines is when you're saying you're living the law and doing the works, did you understand grace at all? In, no. As a, as a, during this active period? Not at all. I, grace, you couldn't even explain grace as a concept to me. I knew that I had to do the prescribed rules in order to get the temple recommend so I could be worthy to be in front of God. And the only thing that was holding me back was a temple marriage at that point. Okay. So do you eventually go to the temple? I do. Okay. I do. Um, when I reached the temple, it was the pinnacle of my existence in the LDS church. I had done it. Yeah. And, there, you know, the one thing I found in this narrative is... I I'm mean, you're being sincere about this, too. I mean, you're oh, trying to get to the temple. This is You feel like you're progressing toward... Toward becoming a god. Towards guess, exaltation. The, uh, celestial kingdom and all that. Okay. Yeah, at that point, I don't even think I fully understood the polytheistic version of Mormonism. Okay. I just knew that I was going to progress to become the best Mormon that I could be, could be. Or better than most people that I knew. Yeah. There was a lot of eyes, there was a lot of ego yeah. in that journey. And so when I finally got my temple recommend, I fully expected that I was going to have a god experience okay. in that temple. So what happened? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to get too graphic because I know there's some sensitivity around yeah. talking about what happens in the ceremonies but sure. I, um, res I respect that too. yeah but I you know I will say <clears throat> there were some instances where with my endowments I was sitting and I wasn't they kind of prepared me for this but I wasn't ready in my temple classes I was sitting in a room with a sheet over me naked um, having someone anoint me with oil yeah. it wasn't a sexual experience at all but it was very uncomfortable so I went from being completely freaked out in that experience to then going into the room and I went to the live version in the Salt, yeah, Lake, Temple. In Salt Lake Temple. I wanted to do it authentically. Yeah. I wanted to go to the place that was, you know, right. the, that, that was the Mecca of, of Mormonism. I was completely and thoroughly confused. The acting freaked me out, and I followed the prompts and just put on the clothes as, as I was instructed. I put the fig leaf on and all that fun stuff. And when we got to the, to the veil, um, I was given my secret name, forgot it immediately. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. didn't get the handshake right. The guy through the fail helped me do, helped me do the handshake right, sure. and then I went into this absolutely gorgeous room, and I just had to sit down and I had to decompress for a minute and appreciate what had just happened because I was frankly I was freaked out. Yeah, I was looking. I wasn't looking for something so ritualistic and and frankly strange, and so I sat in the chair and I just kind of took this beautiful room in. And it's a very clean, white, beautiful room. Yeah. It is. It's yeah, a gorgeous room. room. Yeah, yeah, if you ever get a chance to go in there, you know, go see it. <laughs> um, if they ever do a tour of it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I saw my I saw some family members come through the veil, and I I lost it. I immediately thought this is what heaven must be like because seeing my family members who had lived the the life of the LDS Church, to see them come through the veil, I thought, oh my gosh, this is what heaven must be. And then something clicked in the back of my head, and it stuck with me throughout my experience. Those family members I know had just been in Windover the day before. Gambling. Oh, so that struck you as maybe they sh weren't worthy to be there. You mean? I knew they weren't. Oh, okay. According to what? And, and the thing that, and so then a good friend of mine comes through, and I knew that he had been looking at, at uh, porn before, you know, in, in that week. Yeah. And then another family member come through who I knew secretly drank coffee. So how do you think they got in there? So I'm thinking to myself as this young 21 year old kid who had just, and I, and I was, I was mad. Because I literally had done it for a year. I had proudly lived the life, the words of wisdom, the rules, the meetings. I was doing fast offerings and home teachings. And, you know, you, I was teaching the 14-year-olds, which no one should have to go through. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm looking at my family, and I'm thinking, every single person I know lied to get in this room, and God can't be here. Wow. So at that age, I literally thought to myself, so now I have to become the best Mormon I can to make sure they follow my example. 
So it spurred you on even more then, it in did. a way. It did for about and another two years. you were thinking that, okay, these people have, I guess what you're saying is they're being hypocrites about mm -hmm. acting like they're so righteous, but they yeah. aren't. Yeah, I knew that every person there I knew. There is a certain pride, don't we, have that, I mean, a pride and a, yeah. about, and doing the work ourselves, you're saying, too. And, yeah, and I, I've never had it. Anyone that knows me will tell you I've never had a shortage of ego. It's, <laughs> it's been tamed as I get older. But uh, in my 20s, I, would, I could have run the world yeah. if you had asked me. Yeah. <laughs> I would have given you advice on how to do it. And, you know, that person has been changed dramatically. But, yeah, I literally thought, I, I at one point thought I would have the credentials to be one of the 70, if not one of the apostles. I mean, I was that ambitious. I was going to show everybody. Yeah. The, the, pride, the pride was... Me, 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 and very little God and, and almost no Jesus. Did you talk to anybody either about this in the celestial, or any questions that you had in the celestial room or no. family about this? You didn't mention this? Not to... that I remember. I, yeah. No, I don't think I could have walked up and told my family member, no, no. You, you don't belong here. You know, yeah, that, that would have been, been bad. too much. But... Yeah, that would have been bad. So I, I, I just, I let it go and just continued to progress towards what I felt would be uh, yeah. higher positions in the church. Yeah. Oh. And then what, uh, did you continue going to the temple? And... I did. I, I, I still went. And, and the second time I went, I had to admit to the person at the valley, I forgot my name. And I said, I forgot my name. They go, it's okay. Well, it, it's, it, you know, just, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but they said, yeah. well, it, no, let's say it's Doug. Yeah. And I said, well, it couldn't be Doug. It, it started, it definitely wasn't Doug. I know it wasn't Doug. And that, you know, really freaked me out that they just gave me a totally different name. And Did you realize they gave you a new one each time you went there? Of course, that yeah. that new name was for someone else. But yeah, afterwards when I remembered that name, but I would pay attention and find, and I, I could realize that they were giving out new names. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that to me was just thoroughly confusing, but it was part of the journey. Yeah, you did temple work. So now you're active for an, a period of time here. Uh, you yeah. mentioned five years or so, and what you were busy and doing active. Uh, yeah, your wife was supportive, I guess, during this time. She, you know, I, when she passes, she'll be able to qualify as a saint, being married to me <laughs> all these years. She's so patient, but yeah, she stayed. After the first year, we got married. About two thousand, two thousand one, we were married, and uh, I, we, we, we lived in an apartment, and so I was ten miles away from my home ward. But my our bishop made an exception and let me stay there. And during that time, I was heavily active. I was, I had state callings. Yeah. I was teaching the kids Sunday school. I was doing home teaching. I was doing fast offerings. I was speaking occasionally. You know, I, I was literally part of the community. Well, so what happens? So, uh, 2002, we buy a house. Okay. And ironically, we buy a house a mile from where I grew up. Okay. So, talking, we had a new bishop come in, and, and he made the comment, you know, I asked him if I could stay in the ward. I said, can I stay in this ward? This is my ward. It's my home. And he says, you need to go into your community, which I think was a mature thing to, for a bishop to say. Yeah. You know, go take your leadership and go be a part of this new community. So reluctantly, I left this ward that I had had such a positive experience for so many years. And I went to a new ward that was composed of about one-third people from our neighborhood and two-thirds uh, young couples that had moved into a condominium complex just oh, yeah. behind our neighborhood. And I walk into, a, and all the leadership positions are taken. Um, the church is filled with zealous, young, return missionaries and their families. And uh, I was immediately transferred from being, you know, all-star super Mormon in one ward to being just a member of the congregation oh. in another. And that was an ego. Blow. And an inactive wife or a non-member wife. And a non-member wife. And so the first question I got in Elder's Quorum was, where did you go on your mission? And I said, I didn't. And I proudly told my story of my conversion and how proud I was of getting to the temple. And from that moment forward, I was a second-class Mormon. Uh, I had entirely you lost really my community. That. Yeah, no, we we had tried to reach out to the couples. We tried to go out to dinner. I was excited because I had you know people in my age group that right. I could hang out with, right. and they immediately wanted nothing to do with us. What do you think causes that? I think I think you have a resume as a Mormon. Uh, I haven't talked to a lot it's of comments. Part of the judgment. Yeah. Judgmental. Yeah. 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 I, I think you have a resume, and, and I think the fact that I didn't go on my mission, that I came in late, that I was ambitious, I think a lot of that turned them off. Hmm. And and I, I think their pride, they they literally from if you know if you were to look at the resume, they had more qualifications than I did to hold those positions. And isn't that sad? Not, nothing about your heart. No. About your. Uh, but at the same time, my heart was ambitious. Yeah. I would have gladly taken any one of their positions. Okay. That's who I was back then. Yeah. So I there a dissonance started, a tension started, and I started to not go to church every Sunday. Oh. 
Okay. And that caused a rift because for three years I'd literally done everything right. Yeah. I was tithing. I mean, I followed the rules to the T. I, I did it. And I, I wasn't burned out. Did you feel out. like it brought you closer to God? No. Yeah. Not even, no, now that I look on it now, no, yeah. it was, it was, it was basically shining light on me. <laughs> Isn't that sad? It's sad. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's funny to talk about it now, but, yeah. um, but no, it, it didn't bring me closer to God at all. And so I ultimately had to come to the realization that I was not following the rules anymore. Right. And then I started So that feeling, causes... Uh, tension, tension in and, you and, yeah. and hypocrisy and so on. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, on the Sundays that I wasn't going to church, I was now golfing with my dad. Mm. I was not only not going to service, but I was breaking the Sabbath. Breaking the Sabbath. So I had, to, I had to justify my behavior, and so I went into the fine print, and I started reading the theology. Really? And that's when I started questioning. Started seeing things mm -hmm. that you hadn't heard before, maybe? Right, and at this time, I'm, I'm going to university for the first time, so I'm also learning critical thinking. Okay. And I'm starting to grow maturely, yeah. and uh, and as a, as a student and as a person, and so I, you know, I, I read the uh, words of wisdom, and I could not quite find out how we go from hot drinks to, <laughs> to no co coffee to coffee and tea. And I wasn't drinking coffee at the time, but I sit down in elders' quorum, and there's guys in there that have 64 ounce mugs of diet coke and kidney stones. Yeah, that result yeah. from it. Yeah. So I'm kind of the outsider, and I haven't been to church for a couple of weeks, and I sit down in the elders' corner room, and I say, "How to help me get from A to B. I'm thinking we're in a room full of experts here, yeah. right? These, these guys know what they're talking about. And one guy spouts out and says, well, you know, there's an acid in the coffee bean that eats at your stomach. And I just read research that was absolutely counter to that. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm actually getting a, a degrees in research psychology, so I'm learning how to vet statistic yeah. da statistical data. And I said, no, that's not at all the case. Coffee in moderation is actually good for use, and, and drinking Diet Coke by the gallon is actually not, horrible. Not Aspartame, you, you know, might be a carcinogen. Phosphoric acid. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, and, you know, the elders quorum kind of freaked out a little bit, and I got, well, brother, you need to pray about it. <laughs> Change the subject and talk to me the rest of the the rest yeah. of the elders' quorum meeting, and I, from that point, realized that the men that are running these local neighborhood churches do not understand their doctrine. Well, what kinds of things then started you? Uh, this, this, I guess, impacted you somewhat. And then, what else was there that? Uh... So one more thing happened. I was with a family member, and I'm going to be really careful yeah. not to out this person. Um, family member I care deeply about, who grew up in a racist generation and comes from the background of the war in heaven and how blacks got the color of their skin. Oh, okay. She wasn't even talking about Cain. No. She was talking about the war in heaven. And I was talking to this family member, and, and I, I've been fortunate to grow up in, in a generation where the civil rights movement is taught as a part of public education. So I have a very anti-racist background. And I was talking to this person about just how we're all equal, regardless of the color of skin. And this person mentions that, well, no, there was a war in heaven, and they didn't participate, and that's their, their yeah. curse is Fence black skin. And, yeah. Well, I had just read through the doctrine, and I'm I said, that is absolutely not in the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, or Doctrine and Covenants. Anything about not that? Not at all. Yeah. And uh, this person pulls out a book by Boyd K. Packard, written in 1958, and shows me the words that that person, that he wrote. And uh, I realized that at that we're point, quite racist, yeah. yeah, that we are actually quite racist. And, and I realized that there was a severe disconnect in the theology. And so from that moment forward, I really began to uh, move away from the church. Hmm. Well, Ma now before our time runs out, <laughs> now why don't you tell us how you feel about Jesus? And... So there's, you know, there, I've been thinking about this for a while. There's, there's three things that really, I think, impact me as a Christian. Because I came to the Christian faith years after I left the LDS Church. How long um, ago, how, how much time did go between your leaving and finding Christ? or the About eight, well, I mean, technically 2006 I said the sinner's prayer, but it was about 2012 that I started really becoming serious when God actually called me to some version of ministry, so probably eight, nine years. Wow. Yeah. Eight or nine you years. You can of, see God's hand during that time probably oh, leading you along, but... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the, the amazing thing about being... A Christian and getting out from underneath the umbrella of the LDS doctrine is um, I know that God is real. That's a huge concept that I think this world is missing. Hmm. And I think a huge concept that a lot of churches aren't teaching. Okay. Just the, the, the base reality of God, because when I talk to my secular friends, they either want proof or they don't want to be bothered by religion, but there is a God that is in existence. Is this one of your three things? This is one of my three things, okay. yeah. So the fact that, that God is God definitely exists and, and, and is in control. 
Yeah. That's huge. The second thing is that Jesus and his sacrifice did implement grace. And grace and is now you huge. understand that totally differently, right? I understand grace so significantly, and it, it's so simple. Yeah. Like literally your ticket is punched into heaven by genuine belief. Yeah. It's as simple as that. I don't as a Mormon I was worried and, and I talked to LDS people about their well, living all those rules. And I talk to people in my family that have lived the church for decades and I say, So are you going to heaven if you die today? And they say, I don't know. I mean if I got hit by a bus today I know that I'd be with Christ. Yeah. So grace and it's so simply um, illustrated in the Bible. Yeah. And the third thing is that the Bible really is a solid document, and it has been opened up to me completely. And I love it um, so much in the fact that it doesn't prove archaeology, but archaeology proves its existence. It really, yeah. You literally see towns and people that have existed in the Bible. Now, the, the real, one of the things that really helped me come out of Mormonism is when I was studying the Bible, I really understood that Jesus, even from a secular perspective, existed and people know who He was. And in addition to that, the towns, Jerusalem, Jericho, yeah. they, there is... Supported by archaeology. Supported by archaeology. Yeah. And if you look at the linguistics that, that back up the Bible, there is no other ancient document that has more textual yeah. resources than the Bible. You're talking thousands that support its authenticity. Whereas looking at the Book of Mormon, even the Smithsonian Institute says there's nothing. There's no support. And so as I'm reading the Bible and I'm, I'm looking at all this proof, because I really wasn't a faith person at first. I needed to see evidence in addition to my faith. Yeah. And now my faith has grown because I can see that. And so I'm, I would be doubting Thomas in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that alone, that, is, that has changed my whole life perspective. Wow. And as you say, the Bible now means so much more. and It's a constant daily companion. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think most members misunderstand, most LDS people misunderstand about Christianity, Christians? Well, I think when you're when you're talking about and unfortunately we're almost out of time. Yeah, I'm going to run through this fast. Yeah. When you're thinking about um, the dissonance that it is to be a member of the LDS Church, I've had a lot of conversations with members in the past couple of months that they really do have a question about what they believe in the first place, and they think that grace is too simple, and they really don't understand how you can get to grace because I think they're not studying the words Jesus actually said. Yeah. I actually spoke two thousand years ago, so if you look and at what he didn't say. And a lot of what he didn't yeah, say, and a lot of what he told you not to do. So, you know, from from that perspective, I think they misunderstand grace and because they don't really understand their own theology, and yeah. they don't really understand the words that. And they're really not willing to do much study, I, critical thinking, as you say. Yeah. They're, yeah. Well, Josh, well, <laughs> darn it, we're out of time. We maybe we should have allocated a little more time for this. You're just uh, delightful. Oh, thank you. And I appreciate your story and your commitment and finding Christ. What a joy, isn't it? It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.